going to put those hands together. Come on and give God a praise all over this building. Come on and give it to him. Hallelujah. Give God the glory. Give God the praise. For he is worthy. He's worthy. And the people of God said amen. Amen. Again, this is the day the Lord has made. <clears throat> I declare that we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, there are many folk who may feel like they don't have a reason to be glad about it, but the scripture didn't say be glad about it. It said for us to be glad in it. And so for that reason, I am uh, elated today and uh, glad to um, just be present one more time. Um, uh, thank God for uh, the events that have happened, um, that have gone by, that we called last week, and for the potential and the possibility of those moments that lie before us that we like to entitle next week or this week, and um, we thank God for each moment. Um, there is a word I want to lift up today. Um, in a continuation of um, what I, I want to continue to talk about, the theme that I sh began beginning of this Advent um, season, talking about good news in bad times. Um, there is probably only about maybe two minutes worth of preaching that I would have to do to convince you that we live in bad times. Um, but the good news is that there is good news even in bad times. Amen. And so I want to ask you, um, uh, during this season, often I go, um, last week I was talking from the Gospel of Luke. Today I want to talk from the Gospel of Matthew um, on purpose, chapter 1 of Matthew. Um, I want to lift up a few verses from Matthew chapter 1. And, um, you know, if we were doing church like we normally do church, or I should maybe say as we used to do church, then this would be the right time for folk who were not socially distant um, to say hello to folk and to be nice and cordial, and we had to stop all that kind of stuff, including gathering, but um, uh, for some folk, they were socially distant even when we were in church, amen, uh, uh, and if they wasn't physically distant, they were socially snobbishly different, distanced. Uh, but I bet even the snobs wish they had somebody to hug today. Uh, but uh, thank God that uh, <laughs> it is what it is. Amen. Um, so, uh, so grateful for um, another day. Um, at Matthew, at chapter 1, I want to read um, the first um, 16 verses. Um, yeah, I'm saying that on purpose. I want to, I want to read on purpose the first 16 verses of Matthew. And then um, we will uh, whisper word prayer and pray that God will say something that we can understand today. Amen. Um, from Matthew Gospel at chapter 1, um, beginning at verse 1. Um, and um, wherever you are, at home or wherever you may be, you can read along with us. But it says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judah begat Phares and Zarah of Thamar, or Tamar, and Phares begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram, and Aram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz and Re of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon begat Rehoboam, 
Roboam begat Abi, and Abi begat Asa, and Asa begat Josephat, and Josephat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Jotham, and Jotham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manasseh, and Manasseh begat Amon, and Amon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Selathiel, and Selathiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadoc, and Sadoc begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliud, and Eliud begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is the Christ. Let me keep reading uh, to verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David or 14 generations, and from David unto the carrying away unto Babylon, or 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ, or 14 generations. Amen. And if you sneak a peek at verse 18, you'll see it says, Now the birth of Jesus, right? So there's some things that came before that I want to look at today the good news in bad times amen shall we pray together god how we thank you for the blessing the benefit the purpose the privilege the time you've given to each of us thank you that in your own way you already knew where we would be today socially physically and otherwise so god thank you for the platform which allows us to be reached and to communicate. But God, we thank you that technology can only send waves and show pictures and translate sound. But God, it is your Holy Spirit who has to give us understanding. So God, in all of our getting, I pray today that we will get the big idea, that we will get the understanding of what it is that you would have us to see, know, and understand today, that as we depart from one another, even technologically, that, God, we will go away better than we started today. We ask all of these blessings now in the only name that really matters. In Jesus' name we pray, and every believer said, Amen. I would say to you that I believe that um, introductions are important. Um, introductions are important. They are important because it is how we get to know uh, someone. It is the way our expectations of that someone or something is set. Uh, introductions are important. Uh, it is through introduction that folks understand what to expect uh, post-introduction. Uh, introductions are important, um, and they come in different forms. There are some introductions that are simply personal. When two people don't know each other, it is appropriate, it is polite to say, I'd like for you Brother A to meet Sister B. I'd like for you, uh, Jane, to meet uh, my sister Ruth. I'd like for you, Betty, to meet Ann. Uh, I'd like for you, Mike, to meet John. Uh, it is important because when people don't know each other, it necessitates an introduction. It's, it's just polite even on the personal level. But not only are introductions polite, they are important 
not only on the personal level, but they are important on what I like to call a programmatic level. When someone is going to speak, it is polite and important for that person to have a proper introduction. Folks stand, and that's where people read the resume of an individual to give uh, gravitas, to add uh, credibility to the person even prior to their presentation and prior to what they're going to do. Someone feels it's not only polite but important to give an introduction so you'll know what to expect or even to whet the appetite of those who will be consuming this individual's uh, presentation. I suggest to you that introductions are important on a personal level. Introductions are important on a program level, but they're also important on a professional level. So that when, even before a person comes, if they're interested in a job, if they're interested in a position, if they're interested in a role, they typically will send a resume or what some call a curricular vitae. They will send something that gives a description about who they are, what their experiences are, what the relevant uh, uh, experiences and education in their lives may have been. They want to, even before you meet them personally, you get to meet them on paper. It is a form of introduction because introductions are not only polite, they are indeed as well important. As we seek to know who people are, resumes can tell us one thing. But then there is a deeper sense of introduction that one can get by knowing a person's family. And when you know a person's family, you start to know a little bit more about the individual. On last Sunday, for those of you who still have Sunday school books or may read them on your own or join us on Zoom after the service for Sunday school, for those who were there, last week we talked about the genealogy was, was a part of our text in the Sunday school lesson, and a part of that described portions of the family of Jesus Christ. I said to our class that genealogies are important because they can introduce you to yourself. Because there are things about you that you don't even know because all a genealogy is is a story of a family. And every family, if you have nothing else, every family has a story. The problem is very often we don't know our family story. And particularly those of us who happen to be uh, of the African-American persuasion, very often we don't know our family story because somewhere in 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 in, in America, and somewhere around the 17th, I mean the 18th and the 19th century, uh, our families were torn apart, and we didn't have the benefit of being able to stay closely knit to know who was kin to who. And when you've been pulled from one place to another, exiled from your homeland, it is difficult often to keep up with who you are from a genealogical perspective, thus interrupting your family's story. So, so often people who look like me don't even know their family story, don't even know their story, and as a result of not knowing their story, they need a story because every human needs a story. And I've come to discover that very often folk who look like me become Christian and become hyper-religious because at least in connecting with Jesus, we get a story. It's not necessarily our story, it's his story. We like to call Jesus our big brother, and now we're in the family of God. But we ought to have our own story as well. Jesus has a story. We have a story, but often we don't know our story. And I would suggest to you that it's important to know your story. And before us today, we have the story of one Jesus Christ. That's what verse 1 says. It is the story of Jesus Christ. According to verse 1, I'm not making it up. It says it is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But here's what any Bible reader should ask right up front. If you're a real Bible student, I'm, no doubt you thought this. Maybe you've asked this question. You said, now, I've looked at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're all the Gospels, but what's the difference? As a matter of fact, not only what, what's the difference, the word is that Matthew has Jesus with 42 generations. Luke has Jesus with 77 generations. Somebody ought to ask me, why is that? I'm, 
Thank you. I'm glad you did. Why, 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 why is that? That, that that Matthew says 42, Luke says 77, you should note that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, they all seem similar, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are known as synoptic Gospels. They are very similar, but what you should know is that the author of each was writing to a different audience. They're telling the same story, but they were writing to a different audience. And when you are writing to a different audience, you still tell the truth, but you have to adapt it and adjust it in such a way that it appeals to and makes clear sense to the audience to whom you're writing. Matthew has 42 generations. Luke has 77. Luke has 77 because Luke is writing to Greeks and Gentiles, those who, 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 who are non-Jewish people, and he has to trace the lineage of Jesus back to Adam. And so you find 77 generations. When Matthew writes, Matthew is writing specifically to a group of people who are Jewish. He has to convince them, those same Jews who have crucified Christ, that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. He writes the gospel post-crucifixion, as you already know. But in his writing, he is trying to write in such a way that when a Jew reads it, when a Jewish person of Jesus' time, if you will, reads it, they would understand that Jesus descends directly from Abraham because to the Jews, Abraham is their progenitor. It means everything. If you can connect Christ's family back to Abraham, then they, he'd had a better case to convince them that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. So when he writes, when Matthew writes this, he writes about 40 and what, 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 what the old black preacher called 40 and two generations, right? talks about 42 generations and when he breaks it down he breaks it down in such a way that he's excuse me that he says that there are 14 generations that he goes from Abraham to David and then 14 generations from David to exile in Babylon and then 14 generations from the exile in Babylon to Jesus you add those 14s time three together you get 42 generations but I, I want to suggest to you that when, when, when he is writing to the Jewish people, they are a proud people, they are a proud Jewish people, and they, love, they, they, they believe that you've got to handle their history right. They want, they're, they're concerned about the particular way you handle their history. Uh, let me see if I can give you an example. Um, if, if you're a Bible reader, let me, let, me, let me share this with you. If you read in Old Testament antiquity, here's, here's a good example for you. If you've ever read 1st and 2nd Samuel, and if you were reading them in a canonical order, or the order they come in in Scripture, you read 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and then you get to 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and you say, hold up, I read that already. Because 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd King is the same story that you will read in 1st and 2nd Chronicles, except they are different in a sense. You see, 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd King were written based on what was happening at the time it was happening. 2nd, 1st and 2nd Chronicles was written after the Jews come out of exile in Babylon. And so by the time they come out of exile in Babylon, the Jews who, uh, who, had, who were now rewriting the story edited out some stuff, and they wanted a cleaner version of their history. And so if you read in First and Second Kings, uh, First and Second Samuels, and you read something, for example, about David and, and what David did and should not have done, you'll find two or three chapters. You go to First and Second Chronicles, you'll find two or three verses. Because by the time it gets to First and Second Chronicles, post-exile, they have cleaned it up because they wanted a cleaner version of their history. They edited out some stuff because that's what the Jewish people did. They wanted to handle their history in such a way that it was proper and clean. Let's see, you didn't get that. You didn't get that. Uh, it's like, it's, it's like um, a rated R movie. Uh, it's like their real story is like a rated R movie. And, and, and if you've ever been to a rated R movie, you go to the theater, and when you go to the theater, you get every word, every grunt, every gesture, 
everything. They warned you before it started. This is R-rated, and there's going to be some explicit language. There's going to be some violence. There's going to be some, some, some sexual overtures. Whatever it is, it tells you up front, and then it just shows it to you. That's like 1st and 2nd Sam, 1st and 2nd Kings. But then, if you ever watch it as it gets adapted for television, when NBC shows the same movie and when ABC shows the same movie, it's the same movie from the theater, except it's got some stuff edited out. So, so, so now the words have changed and now the, 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 the scenes have been either blacked out or cut out. And, and so you don't get the same production that you would have had you seen it in the theater originally. That's what's happening when when history is being written to Jewish people, they, they believe in cleaning up their history and their writing. So what happens now, as Matthew begins to write his gospel, it's no surprise that when you really do the math, that if you add up from, from, from Abraham to David, it's really more than 14 generations. When you add up from David to Babylon, it's really more than 14 generations. And sure enough, when you add up the realities of what happened between the Babylonian exile and Jesus, it is more than 14 generations. And, but the Jews don't mind that Matthew has edited out some stuff because it, it is fitting their timeline. And more importantly, he has cleaned up some stuff and they don't mind that he has edited out some people. But you, that doesn't surprise me, but what does surprise me and maybe surprise them is not who he edited out, but actually who he left in. He's talking to them, and he's, he, he says to them that, that there's some folks in here. He, does, he makes two, two, two uh, writing, um, I, don't want, I can't call them errors. No, he makes two unique, he does two unique things in his writing that would make uh, the Jewish people at the time wonder, why did you write it like that? Does two or three things. The first thing he does is he mentions the term Babylon twice, the issue of the Babylonian exile twice. Now, if you know the Jewish people, that, that ain't a high point in their history. They, they, they don't like talking about that being enslaved and captive, and that. They, don't, they don't want to talk about it. But he mentions it twice. That, that's the first thing that, that, that may have thrown them off. But the second thing that may have thrown them off is that he, uh, he does what... Um, I don't even know what theologians would call it, but, but where I'm from, they call it throwing shade. Here it is. Here it is. Uh, uh, he, he, in, he, in the text, begins to describe David, and he says, David begat uh, Solomon. And when he says David begat Solomon, he doesn't just leave it at that. He says, David begat Solomon. Watch this. He, then he goes on to say, by her who had been Uriah's wife. Mm, you missed it. He, said, he, he says, he, he, he leaves this in for these Jewish people to read because they like to clean up their history. But he leaves in there that, that David begat Solomon, two of their big heroes. He said, by, by, by her, he doesn't call her name, just says by her, who had been Uriah's wife. Did you see that? He, he left that in. He, he, had, he put the shade in in, in, in in the context of what he was writing. He lets the Jews know that, that you know, this ain't all. I, I may have cleaned something up and I've edited some stuff, but for a reason, I'm leaving some stuff in here, right? And, 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 and that's a part of the, the third thing that he does that's strange because he utilizes or adds into a genealogy the names of women. Nowhere else will you find in Scripture when you go back to Genesis and these other places and you see a genealogy. One of the things you don't do in genealogical referencing and, and, and backing up the family, uh, it, you, you acknowledge the men. Women's names are not included in genealogy. That's just not how they did in that day. I mean, it just is what it is. I, I'm not endorsing. I'm just telling you that's how it was. But for, for this reason, when we get the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Matthew leaves in the name of four women. Did you hear that? He, he leaves in the name, technically, of five women. Five, five women. He, he leaves in the name of, can I look at it real quick? He leaves in the name of Tamar first. For those of you who know Tamar, Tamar uh, was married to a fellow whose name is Ur, who was the son of Judah. 
Ur dies, and Tamar never has a child by Ur, and thus does not have the promise that was supposed to be for a wife in that time. He, she has not been given a son. Her, her, his brother, Onan, then marries her, does not give her a child. She is supposed to have a child. Her father-in-law, Judah, tricks her and does not give her a child. So she doubles down on it. You trick me? She said, I'm going to trick you. And show sure up, she tricks him. She fools him into lying with her. He impregnates her. She has a child. And thus she is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Hmm? Now, that ain't the already version. I'm giving you the one for TV. All right. But, 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 then, but then he mentions not only her, but he goes on to talk about a woman whose name is Rahab. Rahab, you get a chance to meet uh, in Canaan, because she is, they, they're, they're headed over to Canaan, I should say, and, and spies go out to spy out the land, and, and the word gets out that the spies are in town, and they got to hide out, and they end up hiding out in a brothel. Yeah, that's good. That's a good morning word, and yeah, they get, they end up hiding out, and don't ask me why. They, I don't know why it was a brothel. I'm not sure if nothing else was open, but they end up hiding out in a brothel, and the brothel that they hide out is run by the city's most major prostitute, whose name is Rahab. She is the queen of the red light district. She is the hot mama of that particular town, and they end up at her house, hidden out at her house. She protects them from the spies, later goes on to marry important per you, that That's her. She's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Not only does he leave in uh, uh, Tamar and Rahab, but he goes on to talk about another sister named Ruth. He brings up Ruth, and Ruth is a Moabite. That, that's important to know because they're supposed to be a cursed people who Jews don't fool with. But, but, but at the unction of her mother-in-law, Naomi, she goes back to Bethlehem with Naomi, ends up in Jewish territory, even though she's a Moabitess girl, finds herself... Being a, 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 she is attracted, I'm sorry, there is a man who is attracted to her, and she is not hunting him, he's hunting her, but her mother-in-law gives her some information and some, uh, some advice to speed up the process. She ends up going into his bedroom while he's asleep, sitting at his feet. And, and that's as much as I can say for the television. But you, if you see the R version, you'll know what I'm talking about. And, and that's how, that's who she is. And, and she's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And not only does he talk about her, but he, he talks about Rahab and Ruth and Tamar. But I, I told you already, we read it. He talked about Uriah's wife. This, this, this beautiful woman who liked to take late night baths on the roof. And King David couldn't help himself, but the, the king, yeah, the king who is a who, who is a powerful king is a peeping tom at night. He is he he checks out. You you know if you've seen the story, come to Sunday school, you get the story. But 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 you get the story of Rahab, excuse me, Bathsheba, who who ends up in an adulterous relationship with David, and then David not only is in the relationship and not only impregnates her, but he gets her husband killed. And there she is, right there in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Then they talk about a teenage girl who gets pregnant without the benefit of matrimony. No ring on her finger but a bulge in her belly. One little Miss Mary. All of those people in the lineage of Jesus, that's my introduction, to make my, I only got one point, to make my one point. And that is the good news of the story of the lineage and the introduction of Jesus is that we serve a God who does not need a perfect record to produce a perfect product. You missed it. All right. We, we serve a God. I, that, that's, my, that's my shout. I'm done. I only got two minutes left. Listen, we serve a God who does not need a perfect record. Uh, record to produce a perfect product. Somebody ought to be able to shout even at a home because you don't have to be perfect as long as God is still able. Somebody can be a witness that God is able. That's the story of Christmas. That's, that's the story that precedes Christmas, that God is able. It's not just on December 25th. Every day of your life, God is able to work through your mess, 
Somebody can be a witness. Your life is a message only because it started as a mess. And if you don't have a mess, you can't get a message. God is able to work through your scandal. He is able to work through your scorn. He is able to work through your foolishness. And the story of Christmas begins with God working through imperfection to bring in something perfect. There it is. That, that's my Christmas sermon right there. He redeems, here it is, he redeems the story of your life. That it does not matter where you've been. It does not matter what you have been through. We serve a God who will redeem the story of your life. That could have been a better lineage through which Jesus could have come. Maybe some people who had lived better. But through the lineage from which he comes, they can't control. You can't control where you come from. But when it's your time to show up, you better know God can bless you no matter how much mess you've had to traffic through. Do I have any witnesses here? God can redeem the story of your life. That means every mistake you've ever made, God can work through it. That means that every sin you've ever done, God can work through it. That means every disappointing moment you've ever had, God can work through it. Every error you have made, God can still work through it. The devil is a lie. Every failure you've ever had, God can still work through it. The devil is a lie. Every time you slip and stumble, God can get you up, work through it, fix it, and make you what he would have you to be. There ought to be a witness here. I hope I'm not the only one who can shout that God can work through your foolishness. He can work through it. Uh, I'm finished. I'm finished. But I tell you this, my only illustration today is this, is that I remember in, when I was writing this, this end right here, I thought about the fact <clears throat> that God is able to redeem your story. And Christmas ought to make me shout about anything in the season of the birth of Jesus ought to make me shout about anything is that he can redeem the story of my life. I don't care where it started. I don't care how many bad chapters are in it. He can redeem. And when I think about that redemption, it's shouting. Maybe you get this might help you. When I was a kid, um, in the particularly in the early 1970s, things have changed now. Obviously, it's a lot different this many years later. But in the in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, I used to go and stay at my aunt's house, and uh, my aunt was a, uh, I think she was addicted to uh, Coca-Cola. And uh, so back then, this was, some of y'all remember, this was before there were cans of Coca-Cola. There were bottles of Coca-Cola. So they have little bitty bottles, and then they, when they really started making money, they started making them taller bottles. But, 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 but there were bottles, and the Coke bottles were thick, which meant they, they spent a lot of money on glass to make the Coke bottles. But what was interesting about the Coke bottles is that while you could buy six or 12 or have as many you wanted, and you drink them, nobody threw them away. My auntie had in the closet in the kitchen, kind of in the pantry, stacks of Coke bottles. And... And, and, and what happens is these stacks of Coke bottles were, were, were no doubt sticky and old, and, and they were just sitting in there, and she'd keep them over time, collect them over time, until there were stacks, Rick, stacks of Coke bottles. My cousin and I had to get old enough, David, to figure this out, that though those Coke bottles were old and empty, they still had value. Now, as a kid, we didn't understand the term value. But when we finally figured out what value meant, if you look down at the bottom in the back, if you didn't live in these two or three poor little states, everybody else could take a Coke bottle in to what's called a redemption center. And when you take that in, they will give you something for the Coke bottle. Now, it may not be but a nickel for the little ones, quarter or so, a dime or so for the tall ones, but I got enough sense, and so do y'all, to know enough of them will add up. And so my aunt was, was in, a, in a sense, she had a savings account in the closet, but it was made out of empty, used-up 
Coke bottle. But when me and my cousins discovered they had value, we would steal Coke bottles out of the closet five or six at a time. Not enough to let her know how many was gone. we steal them out the back and at the bottom and stack them back up so she wouldn't know that they were gone. And we'd get enough of them, just enough to get a quarter. Because back then, a quarter could get you a honey bun. Come on, talk back to me. It could get you what you wanted. And, and, and we would take that because we discovered even in stacked up, dirty, and in the back of the closet, empty, there was still value in those bottles. And we took them to the store and at George Terrio in South Louisiana, the store was called Terrio. There was an area in the back. We didn't know even how to understand it, but it said Redemption Center. And we take it to the Redemption Center, and in turn, they'd count the bottles, and then they'd give us the change we had earned from bringing in the bottles. Did y'all hear me? Now, now listen, I, I, I didn't want to tell you. I know you, you've never been to George Terry or you don't even know what's off is. That's all right. I just use it as my analogy today because here's what I want you to know. God knew that there was some folk down here with value. Even though we had been emptied out, messed over, messed up, dirty and sticky, but he says, I'm going to put a redemption set up. My first one is going to be on a hill far away at Calvary. And I'm going to make sure that once I get that redemption center in place, that there will never going to be any human being who would think you had no value. I don't care where you come from. I don't know what your story is, but I've come today to tell you that the redemption center is still open. They don't take bottles no more around the United States of America. You've got to crush cans and stuff now, but that's still good news. There's value in everything created, and there can still be value in everyone created. And if Christmas teaches us anything, is that we serve a God who is able to redeem your story. But not only is he able to redeem your story, nowadays if you bring them in, there's cans crushed, messed up, those cans not only can be redeemed, but can I give you some more good news? They also can be recycled. <laughs> and that what looked look like what nothing can turn around and become something great. There's somebody who needs to hear that, that that's the story of Christmas. It is that God begins his plan of redemption, but he doesn't choose a perfect family to work through. Somebody needs to hear this. Old man said 40 and two generations. All that really means for those who don't want to be too deep is God's been working a long time. God's been trying to redeem your story a long time. That God will keep his promise even if it takes a long time. That that mama who's praying for prosperity, that mama who's praying for a breakthrough, it may not come to you, but your great, great, great granddaughter might be blessed because you started because we serve a God who is working through a long time, but he keeps his promises. He will redeem us. He told Abraham, I'm going to fix it. But Abraham didn't live to see it. But 42 generations after Abraham comes Jesus Christ. Do I have any witnesses? He told Adam, you messed up, but I'm going to fix it. Adam doesn't see him fix it, but 77 generations, Luke says later, God fixes it. And, and sometimes it takes a while, but God keeps his promise. That's a Christmas lesson for everybody. That we have a God who, who has a history, who has a track record of keeping his promises, even if it takes a long time. He'll do it because your story is worth redeeming. Amen? Amen. Let's give God some praise. I know he's worthy. Somebody ought to praise God because he redeemed his story. Pray, somebody ought to praise God because my story don't seem like it's worth redeeming, but he reminds me that there is value even in me. Amen. To God be the glory. Shall we pray together? God, how we thank you now for the gift of understanding, for the gift of grace that even precedes the gift of Jesus. God, in Matthew chapter 1, it's not until we get to verse 18 that it says, now, the birth of Jesus. But there are 17 verses before that remind us, God, that you may take a long time, but you keep your promises. There are 17 verses before that remind us that it is your 
role and your goal to redeem our story. And it doesn't matter the mess that can still be a miracle. And it doesn't matter the failure. It can still be fruitful. Thank you that this season, though draped and veiled by what the world might think is a bad time, that there's still good news right now. That we got a story worth redeeming and a God who keeps his promises. Thank you that we can see that clearly in this season. And God, for that we say thank you. Our goal is to see you more clearly, that we might follow you more nearly and love you more dearly. And God, we thank you for this privilege. We ask it all now. The only name that really matters, the name of that baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, and that crucified yet resurrected Savior, name of Jesus, our Christ, we pray. And every believer said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. worship services this morning. We hope you were filled by God's word and invite you to join us for next week's service at 8 and 11 a.m. or Wednesday. You do, even before you get on, share this with somebody else that they might be blessed by. Thank you so much and we look forward to seeing you as soon as possible. God bless you and we'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us for our worship services this morning. We hope you were filled by God's word and invite you to join us for next week's service at 8 and 11 a.m. or Wednesday at noon or 6 p.m. You can discover Morningstar at mymsbc.org or follow up.